Put okay. your hands together for Fitz from Fitz and the Tantrums. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure. What a pleasure to have you here. Cool, cool, cool. Well, listen, this band, one of the things that's wonderful about Fitz and the Tantrums from our perspective is a lot of what we do with you guys and for you guys at home is we talk about how you can do it yourself. Some of the tools that Avid provides allows you to do things yourself. And the concept of DIY, which Fitz will certainly speak to, is much more than an ocean. It's a lot of work. It's a big commitment, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so one of the fascinating things to watch is to take somebody who's committed to his art, committed to their craft. They don't prostitute it for anything. They don't try to have major labels mess with it. They do it themselves. They do it because they believe in it and watch it work and become successful. Fits in the tantrums. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about the DIY notion and, and how that's brought you to this point. I mean, for me, I've been a Pro Tools user since Sound Designer 2. Mm. Um, and for me, I was just saying oh, next door that, you know, I mean, it was probably the most important piece of equipment I've ever owned in my entire life. Really? Life changing. Because it did all of a sudden give me the opportunity to make music at home. And I've grown with Pro Tools as Pro Tools has continued to become more powerful. I've honed my skills. Um, working with it and uh, as it gets better the sound quality keeps getting more and more dense and rich and warm and the ability now to like I'm just right now I'm just in the virtual instrument zone where I'm creating whole compositions with nothing but virtual instruments in there because I'm just in this sort of songwriting place and I want to be able to change my tempos or change the key of the song and if I leave it virtual all MIDI based then I have the ability to really like hone the perfect key and tempo and all that kind of stuff for the, for the song. But it, it, it's, it's really been, I like, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm not a guy that goes in there and puts crossfade on every edit. I'm very dirty and uh, sloppy because I like it to be a, a tool of creativity. I like, if I'm doing arrangements, I just want to move this part over here. I want to, use the editing capabilities of Pro Tools as actually almost like an instrument or a keyboard. You know, I mean, I think in now our lexicon of what we're all used to listening to, the edit has become its own sort of thing that you can, you know, you hear chopped vocals now yeah. in songs and 10, 15 years ago you would have been like, that sounds wrong. There's Fits on your first album, which I'm a, I'm a big fan of, guys, YouTube. Wait an hour, go to YouTube, check out Daryl's house with this guy. Not too many people can smoke Daryl Hall. He did. <laughs> I don't know about that. But <laughs> on the I first, kept up. On the first EP, you were, you were pretty hands on with that. Did you do a, a lot of the engineering on, on, on the before the dragons? Uh, I did. I mean, the first EP and the first LP, I did uh, all the engineering on it, and I co-produced it with a good friend of mine, Chris Seafried. And we made that record from top to bottom um, at my home mm -hmm. with my Pro Tools LE system um, with one microphone. And, 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 uh, and that, that record led to Leno, Letterman, record deal, I mean, chart positions. And you did it, you did it yourself. We did it all ourselves. I don't encourage this, by the way, because I'm an engineer, but, <laughs> you, but you got to pass. It sounds great. Uh, Thank uh, you very much. You know what? you got just a feel. Your engineering <laughs> skills are good, but it, engineering is just a tool, and you're, you're, those records just drip with emotion and passion. Well, I think, you know, I mean, I'm a self-taught guy. I mean, when I first started working with Pro Tools and working in studios or recording, I literally couldn't hear what compression was even doing. Mm -hmm. Me too. You know, I got my first rack compressor, and I was like, I returned it three days there because I was like, <laughs> I can't hear. And it was only with time that I could start to, like, my ears became in tune to the ratio and how hard it was pushing or clamping down. Um, but for me, like... I kind of take the same aesthetic or the same approach as the Motown records, which was these guys made these amazing records uh, t 
technically totally wrong. Yep. Like if you ever get a chance to go on the internet and surf some of the, uh, just the vocal stems of some of those Motown records, the, the tracks are overdriven, they're distorted. There's technically nothing right about the way a lot of those early Motown records were made. All records, just about. But when you sum it all together, the there's, there's a feel and there's a vibe. Yep. And uh, my approach has always been creativity over technicality or, or that thing. You know? And I've definitely had some battles with producers and engineers because I'm like, I don't care if it's technically correct. I don't want to lose the vibe of whatever I created if it's too overdriven or, or whatever the approach it was to get the... For me, it's, a, uh, it's the performance and about the songwriting and the engineering is secondary to all of that. Let it's, me drift a little bit away from the engineering part a little bit. Like, your respect for Motown is just so evident in what you do, but yet you're not a tribute act. You're, you're clearly, clearly rooted in today's sound. How, how was that? Uh, I mean, that was a that very, very process. conscious thing because we didn't want to be just a pastiche. We didn't want to be a carbon copy because that's my favorite uh, period of songwriting and producing and production. Uh, Mixing the whole thing, uh, it's my favorite all time period of, of music. What's your favorite um, Motown song? Too many to list. I mean, we could go on for days. Oh, but, yeah. uh, Keep going, sorry. Um, but at the same time, we obviously take a lot of influence, but there's just as much the uh, Motown stacks, Gamble yep. and Huff influence, yep. but there's also the uh, British Invasion, mm -hmm. Northern Soul. 80s ABC yep. style council the jam like they were being heavily influenced by Motown they brought it across the pond and then made this sort of their own version of it during the 80s so this record has just as much of an influence from that period of soul music which is already once removed from the original source and as well you know for us there was a lot of elements in that first record of uh just taking the hip hop, old school, like 90s hip hop beat production sort of uh, mentality. So our, I've always said that our record is a, a hybrid of pop music, Motown, 80s, a little bit of indie rock, DIY sort of spirit. And it's more just this hybrid that just worked because at the same time, like I was saying, we, don't, we didn't want it to just be a, you know, a tribute band either. Well, we often preach to, to our audience and to the folks at home that no matter what your influences are, you can't fake authenticity. Like, it's part of your heart, this music. Like, if you were just trying to pull it together and you didn't really feel it, it wouldn't translate. And what I find interesting is that your records and your live shows feel the same. There's that same level of passion right. in both. That's conscious. Is it just part of who you guys are? For sure. I mean, we, you know, I mean, the thing is, so much I think for a lot of us is you make the record first almost a lot of times. Or for me, like I never write a song on just the piano anymore. Like I go right into Pro Tools. I'm already creating a mood and an atmosphere, chopping up a beat, something that gives me inspiration to. I have to feel like the aesthetics of where it's sitting in my in my mind to get a sort of an emotional sort of marker for it. Um, and, you know, I've been a singer my whole entire life. And when you're a singer, a trained singer, you can sing many different styles. And then the larger question begs, well, what if I can sing any style, what is authentic to me? Mm -hmm. um, and I was always, like I said, a huge fan. I mean, the Motown was the first music I ever absorbed on the oldie station on the drive to school in the morning. Negotiated with my mom to let, uh, like, play something halfway <laughs> contemporary on the way to school. But I never believed that I could actually kind of sing in that style. And it was really when I got this old church organ and had one of those inspirational moments where a song almost wrote itself and it was late at night, no one was around to judge me, that I sang in that style. Wow. And it was the first time in my whole entire singing career that it felt completely true and authentic and real. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up here in oh. L.A. Right. Yeah, in fact, the first time I heard you sing, I said, if I ever interview him, I'm gonna have to check his pigmentation because it was it was real black. It was real R and B. No better compliment. And, and listen, no, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, your mixes are black, for sure. <laughs> but it's just so, and so when you hear you up against or singing with Daryl Hall and folks like that who have that gift, it's just a joy. Like, no, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I'm, I'm yeah, Dave came, came to my room much. this morning going, man, have you heard this and heard that? It was, it's really... I, I mean, that day with, da with Daryl, doing Live from Daryl's House, was... That's was a, a very, moment. very special day. Yeah. That was very early on in our Nicole, career. And if you actually um, Sarah smile, Nicole, say Noelle. say hello oh. and so, tell Ooh, Noel. I know she kills uh, Noel, it. excuse me. Noel no, okay. is like amazing. But that moment, speak of that. I mean, look, we are with this you actually sort of pull us and our audience at home together because we're all DIY. We're right. internet guys doing it yourselves. These guys are doing it themselves. We encourage them doing it themselves. We encourage those guys to do it themselves. So since you kind of tied that all together, Daryl's house for you guys was a big inflection point in your career. Like it, it compared bigger than doing late night TV, correct? Absolutely. And for me, like I just love the spirit because once again, here was Daryl. He wanted to be creative and he came up with this idea. I'm just going to invite people to my house so cool. in upstate New York and we're going to make music and hey, let's start videotaping it or recording it, and then they start putting, putting it up on the internet, and it just had its own DIY organic moment where it spread worldwide. Yep. It just started, gro kept growing and growing. Fitz, I don't know you that well, but can I tease you? Sure. Okay, you said that you wanted to create a band that didn't have guitars, because you were a little bored with guitars, you don't hate them, but you gotta admit, the guitar on Daryl's house was good, wasn't it? It was a totally different <laughs> thing for us, and I, I actually guitars. loved hearing it. But yeah, when we started off this band, it was like, we're gonna make a band, we're gonna go for that huge Phil Spector wall of sound vibe, and we're gonna do this band without guitars. Personally, part of the thing is like, I can't stand noodling at rehearsals, uh -huh. and guitar players are the worst How noodlers many of, all, of all time. <laughs> You I'm a guitar player. So you guys know how much you noodle. <laughs> um, yeah, we do, don't we? Although I thought what was interesting about that is that noodle. from your perspective, when you move, when you remove the guitar, it leaves room for the pocket to be more pronounced. Some of your signature sounds, like with the sax and stuff, is more pronounced, and the focus on the song. Yeah. Right? Is that what it does? Well, for sure. I mean, I think that we wanted to challenge ourselves and say, can we achieve a live show? Can we achieve recordings without guitars on there? Guitars are frequency very dense, especially if there's any sort of drive or distortion. True, I mean, they, they take up this register, everything. And, and they should. They're great we, instruments. You know, <laughs> but the amazing thing that we've found is you take them out and then you go play live. Right. And hey. you have clarity. Right. It's so much easier to mix our show. Mm-hmm because there isn't that. And it definitely created this great pocket for the rhythm section, the yeah. horns, and really became the centerpiece of what the, the songs are about, which is a return to like singing real melodies, mm -hmm. no trickery to that, no production trick, it's just straight up singing. And as a, oh, I'm I was just gonna say, as a technique for these guys, and again, guys at home, sometimes you get addition by subtraction. You know, you, you yeah. subtracted something and you actually got more, you got closer to what you wanted to do it. So sometimes it's what you decide not to do that can be as important as what you are going to do. So, you know, you work that process and you'll get to your place. This is probably a little off topic, Fitz, but you're, I go see a lot of bands live and then I get the record and I'll, I'll use the word disappointing. How do you maintain that correlation because your live show is different than the records, but they're both the same, uh, in the sense that uh, you, you, you've maintained that, that feel and vibe and it translates. A horrible question, and it's actually written better for no. me here, but I, I'm trying to say your, 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 your records feel live and your live concerts feel like records. Well, I think one, I'm very blessed that everybody in the band uh, is bringing a whole lifetime of experience. I mean, these guys have dedicated their self almost with myopic obsession on their craft, on the thing that they do. Um, John Wicks, our drummer, Jeremy Rizumna, keyboards, James King, our one man horn section, Joe Carnes on bass, and then there's Noel and I singing, but they're all so proficient at their instruments. They all had their own deep love affair with Motown, with soul music. And when we had our first rehearsal, it was literally one rehearsal. We played the first song, 
and we could have gone and played a show that night. That's just how good those guys are. They make me feel incredibly confident when we're playing live. I know that the foundation is there. And yeah, we made that record first, and then we started to play shows very soon after. But um, we just found that there was this whole energy, because all the songs are sort of relationship, heartbreak songs, that because Noelle and I was there, we just sort of naturally sort of started turning towards each other and singing these I love you, I hate you uh -huh. <laughs> songs to each other. And as we got going with the, the band, we just kept upping the performance aspect of it. The shows are, are a very uh, nonstop energy. We, I, we want a lot of uh, call and response with the audience. We want a lot of participation with people. We literally will shame people if they're sitting down and tell them to get up Absolutely. and, and dance <laughs> and, and have fun. Um, and so the, the live show almost took on this heightened energy that the, the record did. And we, when we made this new record, we kind of made sure to bridge the difference between the great record job, and the live show. Uh, the tempos were very different from the r record to the live show. We just kept kind of pushing the tempos up because we were trying to keep just turning the heat up on the intensity of what the shows were, where it almost became like a, a churches in session kind of moment live. You know, in fact, you can explain to the audience, one of the things I love, particularly as a manager, that you guys really honed in on is the live show is, is real estate and equity that nobody can mess with it. That's yours. Nobody yeah. can steal it. Nobody can copy it. It has your signatures. Nobody can vote whether to sign it or not sign it. It's either good. You can adjust right. it. That's an important part of the hub of, of, of the group, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say that, obviously, one always has to start with great songwriting. Yeah. Above production, above engineering skill. At the end, if you don't have great songs, none of it matters. You can't polish a turd. Yep. You know? Secondly, obviously, you want a great execution for your songs. Um, but now more than ever, you have to be able to play and play well and kick ass live. And for us, you know, we just went out and hit the road and played five people next night, 500 people the next night, 20 people. And we just didn't stop for two and a half years to the point where our reputation around the country started being like, you have to go see these guys play live. They're bringing in it like nobody's business. It's a, you know, especially with so much playback and synthesizer and stuff, I think it was refreshing for people to just see like the bare down essentials, which is just bass, drums, keyboards, and sax. No guitars, no that. And it's like everyone's pulling double duty to try and fill up the sonic space to get it close enough that it could replicate the record, but at the same time, it's its own thing. And we just built this reputation on this live show, and that's really, I think, that what sort of helped uh, propel our career. Didn't Daryl Hall, you were playing in New York, and didn't Daryl Hall's uh, tattoo guy recommend you to Daryl? Is that the story? Oh, no, that's another one was that Adam Levine from Maroon 5. Maroon 5's guy, was yeah. Was turned on to them. us by his yeah. uh, tattoo artist in New York, and then a week later we were on tour opening up for Maroon 5. How was that? That was an amazing experience, you know? I mean, it was like we went from literally playing Hotel Cafe, which I'm sure many of you know, in Hollywood, yeah. little singer-songwriter place, which, yep. uh, honestly, our band has no business playing on this little triangle stage that's meant right. for, like, right. Ed Sheeran or something, you know? Um, and uh, all of a sudden, we're playing college uh, gymnasiums and arenas with, uh, with Maroon 5. It was a really important thing. But to come back to the live from Daryl's, that was for us more important than anything else. That, was, that preceded the Tonight Show and yeah. Leno and Jimmy I mean, Jimmy Fallon. once we did live from Daryl's house, anywhere we went worldwide, fans came up, found you because of live from Daryl's house. We're in Australia, half the audience came up to us and they're like, we found out about you because of live from Daryl's house. How many songs did you do, seven? I don't even know if we did seven. We did maybe between five and seven, we did a couple of super obscure, Daryl tracks because we felt like everybody goes for his 80s catalog and if you know Daryl he's actually one of the original Blue Eyed Soul singers Absolutely. behind Todd Rundgren you know Absolutely. it's like Good one. you know he is 
that's where his foundation. So we went deep into his archive and found like the first song he ever recorded that he won at a talent show that got him his first oh, really? one-off oh, record cool. deal with Gamble and Huff. We did this other track called Perky Omen with him um, and really sort of tried to tie in his soul influences to ours. You know, and if you know the format of the show, you sing some of your songs, you sing some of his, you trade verses. Yeah. It was pretty amazing to look over. I mean, this was so early on in our career. If you watch the episode, I'm smiling <laughs> ear to ear like a little girl the whole yeah. entire you time. Really I was really starstruck because that's one of my all-time idols Absolutely. and who people vocally say I most uh, sound His like. His mama said that. Daryl's yeah. mother said that. You sound like my son. You know what? As as the Avid guys get, you know, we're gonna get a couple of questions. You guys got some questions for for Fitz or for us? We're gonna get some microphones out to you. Tell us what you're looking forward to. Where what's coming up in the world of Fitz and the Tantrums? Um, well, we were very fortunate enough to uh, sign with Electra Atlantic. Yep. And um, Jeff went over there, didn't yeah, he? Jeff yeah, Jeff from Dangerbird went over there, and we're just putting the finishing finishing touches on our new record. Um, and we're super excited about it. And I think the first single's coming out in end of February, early March, oh, something like that. So you coming get back right in up. touch with when it's about to come out. Why don't you come to come do our show? Absolutely. Oh, we'd Absolutely. love to have you. We're in LA, so that's easy. Anytime I can sleep in my own bed at night, that's like a, a win for me. Oh, so. I mean, that 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 would be fantastic. So the, do you feel already the difference between the sort of major machinery? Um, Just or, feels like more support. Yeah. Definitely more support because we started out DIY. Everybody in the band basically like starved themselves for the first two years. I took my whole entire life savings and put it in because when we got these amazing opportunities like tour with Maroon 5, it's like, well, that's going to cost money to do. They don't pay you enough. As right. many of you know, when you're an opening act, they pay you piddly squat. So it was like, wow, amazing life-changing opportunity open up for Maroon 5, but it's going to cost you collectively $20,000 to go do the tour. How are you going to do it? That's, that's and it was like either I took my life savings from the production work that I had done before and rolled the dice. And uh, we, we, we rolled the dice and it paid off. You know, I don't always recommend it because it's definitely a does, super risky thing does, to do. But Does your songwriting skills carry you outside the, the band mode? Do you write for other things? You... Yeah, definitely. I've, I mean, I'm just obsessed with songwriting. That's what I spend all my free time doing is that and creating tracks as well. And uh, So I've been putting a lot of energy into trying to write for other artists. I did a track for this artist named ZZ Ward. I wrote a, co-wrote a song with her and produced it. That's how her record came out. And then... Uh, working with another soul guy, Eli Paperboy Reed, and then just writing with... I love all kinds of music, so for me to like get to move into other arenas, other styles, is really exciting for me. And when I'm not singing, then I don't have to be so precious yeah. about it. You know? I, always, I always tell all of my friends out here, singers sing, writers write, producers produce. When you wake up in the morning and you want to know what you are, that's what you are. The first thing you do, right? It's like you can't not write. It's easier to write than not write. Have you done any film or TV stuff? Not really. I mean, I used to, back in the day before this band, I used to do a little bit of that, but I actually didn't love... I love the... It's a different world. Yeah, I mean, scoring and that kind of thing, films, it's... I don't ha I have ADD. I can't focus for that long. I like the three-minute song format. Like, I can focus on that. You know, already trying to get an album done was, like, hard enough to, like, stay with the focus to get it done. Right, right, right. Are there, is there microphones out in the audience someplace? I'm, okay, anybody got a question? Raise your hand, we'll get to you. Somebody on this side, there we go. Let me get this guy back here, he went up there first. Make it quick, make it loud. I do well with music, but uh, for you being a creative artist as you are, what's the best feeling you ever had with any song that you've ever created? The best feeling I ever had, I think, was the first song I ever wrote for Fits and the Tantrums called Breaking the Chains, of, which was coincided with the acquisition of this cheap $50 organ on the side of the road that I had to mad dash to move into my house. And it was just a new vocabulary that inspired me, sat down, and the song just wrote itself. And as I was writing it, I was almost outside of my body looking down at the experience going like, 
this might be the best song you've ever written up to date. And I think that, and just to put it in context, I'm still waiting for another one of those moments four oh, years dude, later. Money Grabber, so. the, you, you've had them. You've had Money Grabber is my favorite song of Thank yours. Thank you. Someone on this side? Actually, you just answered my question. I was going to ask you about how it comes down as a gift, like in the mail almost. Just, well, just ask her a question. Well, that's your second question. Where do you uh, find the balance between analog gear and digital gear? Uh, honestly, I'm a completely digital guy. And I made this whole first record, which is incredibly vintage sounding, if we'll use the, the word, all in, all in Pro Tools. But I was just not uh, overly tweaking inside. And I actually did a lot less EQing on things. I left things just more flat and dark. And that's actually what sort of balanced the digital realm and trying to get this warmer, darker sound. Um, I just find that I have outboard gear, but honestly, Pro Tools is now at such a level, the plugins are at such a level, the virtual instruments, that whatever loss I'm getting is so, it's only like us tweakers that know the difference. <laughs> because people that are listening to music, they're just feeling music, they're, con they're, they're absorbing the music. They don't give two rats asses about like the the super technical part of it and it's honestly like when I'm working I want to be I'm just fast and I'm like get out of my way sloppy editing plugins virtual instruments just I get excited and I'm just building the track and it's just easier for me to keep it all inside Pro Tools because also I'm building my mixes as I go because I hate listening to something that doesn't feel balanced, so I'm building these mixes. And every time I open Pro Tools back up, it's exactly where I left off. There's no recall. There's no, what was that chain? How did I get that? I mean, I am an advocate, obviously, for a lot of times plugging in some of the keyboards or sending the keyboards that are internal through reamping and stuff. Sometimes there's definitely that pushing air thing that that gives you more of that depth that you might be looking for. But generally, I'm all digital. I grew up with Pro Tools. I never was a board guy. So I've always remained in that world. I feel completely inept in a studio because I just sort of, <laughs> I'm like, if you give me Pro Tools, I'm a whiz, move aside. But a, a regular studio, I'm kind of, I have no idea what anything does. Wow. Me too. Wow. Who else? Somebody over here? And I wanted to ask Dave, because we were, we were talking earlier about Mick DSP, you're talking about creative Louder. space. Louder. Oh, sorry. Um, we were talking about creative space. And I wanted to ask uh, both of you guys, actually, how do you, um, especially for, for you when you have a few hours of work ahead of you in the morning, create this kind of creative space in your head to start working and then maintain it throughout the day so that you keep being artistic and throughout the entire process of creating a song, creating a mix, whatever you're doing? Yeah, I'd be... I'm curious to hear what Fitz says. Creativity is is uh, is a subject you know that's really near and dear to my heart, and uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I'm going to answer it anyway in the tradition of Pensado's place. Um, I think what you're trying to say is, and, and I'll answer it this way: I'm not creative 12 hours in a day. What I do for a living, there's parts of that day that are very technical, and there's parts that are creative. A, a close friend of mine, Steve B's over here, he's worked with me. He'll tell you, there's sometimes I just leave the control room and go, Steve, I can't deal with these strings. Please just, I, I don't want to hear them. Can you do them for me? And then when I come back, then I'm creative. So y y you have to surround yourself with an atmosphere that, that induces creativity. I don't mean to be corny, but you got to kind of take care of yourself. You know, you got to take care of, of, of all the different hackneyed kind of just things we don't want to do like diet and exercise he couldn't maintain the schedule he maintains if he doesn't pay attention to his health and 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 when you're not feeling creative you can't force it you just have to do something else and, and for me i never go more than six hours without being creative it's hard to describe but it's a wonderful question i'm, I'm anxious to see what you say fitz well i think uh I'm probably similar to you, like it's, it's not something that I think about, but it's literally a scratch, an itch that needs to be scratched often. And if I don't satisfy the creative bug inside of me, I actually feel out of balance as a person. And that's what always has motivated me. Um, but I'd say that most of the time in the studio, uh, 
I'm approaching most of it from a creative uh, standpoint. Like I hate the technical, the bouncing tracks, stems, all this stuff. I unfortunately don't have any assistance, so I'm forced to like sometimes take that over. You know, I'm switching Pro Tools system right now, and I have to like go break down every one of what my old songs. To? I just got Pro Tools 10 with the HD native and the Omni rack. Um, <laughs> because I was rocking Pro Tools 6. 6? <laughs> That's illegal in California. For uh, the last four years. You know, and I actually made the record on pro, both you know the, the last records on 6. The assault rifle man just took that out. You can't use that anymore. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you, it was uh, made making those records incredibly challenging. But... Uh, Creativity, I mean, it's like I, I think you just do and you keep and you get into the ritual of being creative all the time. And sometimes in songwriting, you're blessed to have that moment where the song just sort of comes through to you. Most of the time, it's like a little bit of inspiration with a little bit of work and then it's toggling back and forth. And then every once in a while, it's that song that is the friggin' bane of your existence that you want to throw out the door seven times over. Um, and for me, I try to find where the balance of, do I keep banging my head against the wall? And then I get that breakthrough moment with the idea, the part, the melody, whatever. Or sometimes I also have, because I am the guy that will j literally just pound it to the ground and be wiped out by the end of the day. So I do that sometimes and the reward is there, but sometimes I've also learned, you know, it's like today's just not the day for it. Yeah. I'm going to go focus on the technical thing or exactly. something else. I have a lot of business to take and care of for the band, so I just go do something else and give myself a little break. And, and in the event somebody here is not a producer, an engineer, or a business person, or a spouse, there's a whole side to learn about how to deal with people who are creative when they're banging their head against the wall or when they need a break, or when you need to be on them, or you need to get off of them. So there's a process on both sides of the True. equation that True. become really important for all you guys at home and for all you guys to know. Who's got the next question? Uh, and hey, guys in the back, questions now. You, you're not left out of it. Um, uh, Michael, what's your top three um, virtual instruments? Top three virtual instruments? Well, it's from my uh, Pro Tools 6 catalog, <laughs> uh, probably uh, compact or contact from uh, Native Instruments, wow. just wow. as a all-around workhorse. And I actually uh, love T-Rex uh, mastering suite. And what I tend to do a lot is like, the sounds are pretty good, basic, but they're a little generic in that earlier version. So I will, if it's a piano, a string, a flute, whatever, I will slam the hell out of it, it, you know, put the mastering plug in actually on the instrument track, and it seems to sort of just Great squash idea. it and bring out all these cool transients. Say, say that again slowly. Master, oh, the mastering <laughs> plug in. <laughs> and it just seems to bring a lot of vibe to sometimes those slightly uh, flat sounding virtual instruments. Uh, what is the one that I've been using? Uh, hybrid, which I, uh, is a synth sort of plugin, which I've just have milked for all it's worth uh, trying to create uh, uh, as many different virtual synth sounds because I have almost no uh, synth plugins. Uh, those are kind of my two, you know, obviously, uh, I forget what my piano plugin, but you know, I mean, the, the basic for that, I mean, I'm excited for me, it's like I'm taking the step up to like Pro Tools 10 and like, getting into Massive and, and all these other ones. How critical is Noelle to your, your creative process in terms of writing? Uh, I mean, she has been, she was my uh, partner in crime on this last record especially. I mean, everybody in the band contributed, uh, you know, but songwriting, pop songwriting, and I put us into that category of pop in the popular sense, the best sense of the word, maybe not what some people Right. view as pop um, is at the end of the day it's about the melody and the lyrics that's the most important feature to a song and it's hard to rely on anybody but Noel and I for that part of the songwriting question somebody 
Anthony, you're on your high horse, Anthony. Get them back there in the back. Yeah. Back here. We'll get to you. What's up, guys? Big fan hey. of the show. I watch all the shows. Thank um, you. Going back to the do-it-yourself method and talking about that, um, I play in an alternative rock band, and, and we're kind of, we just finished our new record, and we're getting ready to promote it and go, you know, get involved with PR companies and stuff like that to get, you know, the best promotion possible. So I, my cr question was directed towards you, uh, Fitz. Uh, it, it's 2013. Would you say touring is, is, a, is a, as effective as it was years ago? Or and now that the social media is kind of coming into play, what is the best way to market a band that doesn't have the advantage of a record label of these, this mass promotion and... The do it yourself. What's the best way? Right. Well, from living it myself firsthand, it's everything all the time, nonstop. You know, it's like you're doing everything. You're doing your social media. You're giving away a track on your website. You're playing as many shows as you can, building your fan base as far as you can physically go and as many times as you can do it. You're collecting 5, 10, 15 people at a time, whatever it is. It's, I think the, the critical thing is not to, like, especially when you live in a town like L.A., which can be so industry-centric, is that people Absolutely. a lot of times just get completely focused on record deal, record deal, record deal. And trust me, I lived that world for many a year, and if I had actually done it the way that I did it with this band, I probably would have gotten there sooner. But it's doing everything, and a lot of times it feels like, God, I just did this weird website, you know, interview this thing, that thing, and you're like, is any of it doing anything? And hopefully at a certain point, there's a little bit of that critical mass moment that happens. Uh, but I say it's everything all the time. But it's being a band, being a musician, playing out. It's not wasting as much time on the record deal and that stuff. It's going out and creating something real and organic that's what music is about. You're writing music, you guys are playing it, and people are listening to it and getting into it. And if you build something there, that is an authentic thing. We did that, and we built our level of success to the point where the, the industry could no longer ignore us. You know, it was like, we're packing in people at these shows, you guys never have given us the time of day, and then all of a sudden they started coming towards us a little bit more once they saw that we had actually created an organic fan base. Can I, can I add to that one thing? Which is exactly how our show works. It is nonstop. All the, it, you know, there's a third wheel to our little stool, a third leg, and right on the other side of that cameraman, there's a guy. Will, raise your hand. So that's Will Thompson, the producer of our show. And if you enjoy our show, let me just tell you, we would not be here without him because everything he just said Will does all the time and makes sure we do. We constantly grind at it, bit by bit, fan by fan, and we're blown away at the gift you guys have given us, which makes us then keep reaching farther to make sure you're satisfied. So if you do that model, and, and Fitz is right, it's all the time. There's not one thing you can leave out. It's a gig. That part is a gig, right? I mean, when you add social media into it, I mean, it is... I mean, I'm like, sometimes we're on the road and we just played three shows in one day and they're like, yeah, managers are like, can you do a post? And I'm like, like oh, I got hell. no energy for a <laughs> exactly. Farfik Nugan post right now, but okay. You know, That's I mean, it's like you have, me. <laughs> and it's a different relationship now because you put more that you are active on your social media, it's not so much about always self-promoting, like, look at me, look at me, right. you know, because that gets annoying. Then it just become like, you're just an advert. It's like giving people access to your lives. Yeah. Well, a little photo of you at Soundcheck, uh, hanging out, what it's like to be in the van on day seven in Montana, yeah. you know, or whatever. Giving people access, and people want that sort of connection, and the deeper that connection is, I think the more invested and the more they'll invest in you as an it's, artist. It's the substitute, it's the substitute for the old album cover. <laughs> you know? It is. And you're creating relationships, and they, and they have to be honest. If they're not honest, when, who's on this side? Anybody in the, got something? There you go. Hey, Fitz, how you doing? Hey. Uh, yeah, I just have a question for you about uh, your production and arrangement. Uh, how much do you think about your audience and your fans when you're putting together a track? Um, how much do I think them? I mean, when we were making the first record, there was no fan base, so it was basically like I just had a idea, this is the kind of sound we want to do. And then it was being really uh, diligent about not letting that 
pers- uh, that uh, spectrum of what we were doing get too wide. Because I think at the same time, you know, I can do lots of different styles of music, but I wanted to keep it very narrow, like this is what it is. Because the wider it got, then it gets harder for people to understand and, inter- and enter into your music, especially at the beginning. Making a second record, it's like all the cliches of like sophomore record are true. It's the most stressful moment because now you have fans and they're going to want something. Is it the same thing that you want? We didn't want to make the same record. I have lots of other influences. We wanted to progress. We wanted to push the sound forward. And at the end of the day, I kept biting my nails in the pre-production and writing phase of the record and sleepless nights just waking up with panic attacks. And I just came back to the idea that like, we're going to make a record that we love. And if we're happy, hopefully people are going to follow. I'm sure we're going to lose some of our fans maybe and hopefully gain some other ones because it's not the same record at all. It's actually not vintage sounding at all. No joke. Uh. But from what I've heard from people, they also say it still feels like us. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, maybe they're lying to me, but I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Let's, uh, let's get two more on each side. We want to leave some room if you guys want to take a snap or come up and say hello. Sure. It's all I, about the song. Yes, it's all about the song. Uh, two quick questions. Song. What's your preferred vocal chain for recording? And how many songs do you start compared to how many you finish? Uh, my like preferred question. vocal chain is I have an old CV, uh, Neumann CV 635. I think oh. it's like the old... I think they used to call it the Hitler microphone because it was literally the little <laughs> one that's uh, like a bottle yeah. mic. It's almost very similar to like what uh, Blue created, Blue Mics. Oh, yeah. It's like a small one with a capsule, super dark sounding, which lend itself to like the song. And then I'm just going through some cheap TL audio pre-compressor direct in. And then oh, when I'm so- in, I put uh, a limiter and then an EQ and then uh, reverb, and that's pretty much it every time. This side? How many songs do you start? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, how many songs do I start? Um, I'd say it's about like five or six for every 10, if I'm lucky. I mean, also, we also wrote 40 songs for our album, and 12 of them are on the record, because I also think you don't, you don't, can I swear on this show? Yeah, sure. You don't shit gold every time, so <laughs> you got to up your odds. By the way, um, there's a plug-in for this. It's called shitting gold? You can't, shit gold plug-in? You can't polish a turd, <laughs> but there's a plug-in that allows you to Buff it. spray paint it gold and roll it in glitter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I need that one, then. Now as the show just starts to dive and go to <laughs> the Pinsadian place, who else has a question? Nobody? You're not over we here. We do. Francisco, here. we got the lady in the back. Hey, okay. Up, Let, let's do the lady in the back because we need some sex appeal. <laughs> we need some ladies on this gear talk. Right, That's right. Um, being that you like to edit and then leave rough edges, do you find yourself explaining that to people a lot because it's outside the box? Um, I think less now, but definitely in the early days. Uh, you know, but whenever I hand over. You know, like, the first record we did start to finish at my house. This record we did all the pre-pro and a lot of the basic, like, vibe and programming at my house. And then we brought it over. We did the record with Tony Hoffer, producer, who was just my partner in crime on the record and amazing. But literally, he would just wince at my sessions. Nothing was labeled, no track names, no crossfades on a single thing. Uh, you know, but I figured for once in my life, I don't have to be the guy that has to put the crossfades in. So I put a, took full advantage of it. Well, you shouldn't ever do that, but now you can afford an assistant. But I will say that sometimes, like, some of the editing is meant to be the way it is, and it creates, especially if you're chopping up vocals and stuff, it's supposed to be that way, and then an engineer will come in and put a crossfade, and then it actually loses the attack, hey, or it loses the cutoff. And I'm like... No, leave it. And they're like, there's a pop or a click. And I'm like, so? Hey, Anthony, why, why can't Pro Tools be smart enough to recognize what the track is and label it for you? 
Right? And, it can and, tell a guitar from a drum. And Anthony just left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody in the back? Well, let's Francisco. Let's just, Francisco Anthony, we got right over here. Francisco. You, Francisco it is. Francisco is going to get his own show if you keep asking questions. How many times have <laughs> I got to answer your questions, Francisco? Uh, ten more times, I think. Contractually. There you perfect, go. Perfect. There you go. Um, that restraining order is still invalid now. <laughs> I think the, uh, for me, uh, as a... I really wonder, as a record producer, what you both do to capture that live sound, to capture that live feel. I think, I think that's what's missing in a lot of new new recordings is is that feel. So, what do you guys do, and what do you think is the most important part to get that? I take it from uh, let, let you do it because I um, record almost well, nothing let's, live. Let's so let's deconstruct let's deconstruct a, a record that doesn't sound live. Probably the biggest component is that you've quantized everything. Now, Fitz, Fitz mentioned, hey Mike, Fitz, Fitz mentioned that, that he liked to add some air to things. So the sound, of, the sound that's created in a room is going to sound totally different than, than just something out of a virtual synth. And so we try to, we try to compensate with, for that with reverb. Like he said, he used deverb. So it's a combination of re-recording it in a space I forget which song, one of my big hits, I can't remember if it was, I don't think it was Single Ladies or Beautiful or, I can't remember which one of my big hits it was, but I actually took the drums, ran them back out into the studio, through a couple of sets of speakers, Steve's helped me do this before. What song did we do that on with you anyway? It doesn't matter. And we, you, we set a couple of speakers out in, the, out in the studio, then we set a couple of microphones and then I fed all the drums except the cymbals to those, re-recorded it, brought it back in. So I, so I actually had the sound. Back in the day, stop me if I get too long. Yeah, that's good. Back in the day, we would take a, a snare, run it through a 12-inch speaker, set it on top of a real snare, and the, and the percussion of the speaker hitting that snare, you could, you could record that and get some ambience that way. So a combination of... Stop quantizing. As, as bad as your feel is, it's probably better than, uh, than quantization. And if you do quantize, you don't have to bring it directly on the beat. You can just nudge it closer to the beat. So I'd say feel and the sound of something recorded in a room is a place to start. And then, and then for about five years straight, listen to everything that came out of Muscle Shoals. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, yeah. your records have great feel. Oh, no question about it. <clears throat> Tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, fits in the tantrums right outside to the left. Where I think it's six to eight. Is that what time? Six to eight. <clears throat> You're all invited. An incredible party. Please put your hands together for Fitz, our guest. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you for our show. Thanks, bud. What a great guest. What a great guest. Thanks, Fitz. Uh, Avid, we thank you so much for providing this opportunity. We're going to be back tomorrow for our 100th episode, the gift that you guys gave us. We're going to give some gifts to you guys. We're just going to have some fun. We're going to be, have some special guests. We want to see you tomorrow. Dave, take us home. Woo, man. When we started uh, the day off today, I was really excited about, about meeting Fitz, and, and, and I come from the same background that he comes from. I like the way he's taken his influences and translated them into a modern... Um, form of entertainment and uh, it was just a pleasure to meet you Fitz hope to see you soon and guys what can I say about you guys you guys are the best you guys at home we love you too bye bye <laughs>